a kind of resource with an identifier and provide a user with um, different properties that, that values can be entered for. So at our institution, uh, we had more than a dozen catalogers commit to pilot the tool and they spent maybe a day or a half a day a week over about two months. Um, so it, it ended up being a, a significant amount of time for each of these catalogers and, and we've received reports um, and really great feedback from them. Um, and this has been really helpful to us in evaluating the use of these profiles. So one really predominant theme was the difference uh, moving from a MARC environment where the work happens in a single record. Um, and we see here the OCLC connection user interface. Um, and certainly as the MARC record is populated with values in the fields and subfields, um, the different um, RDA elements that uh, that are used to populate those values certainly are making statements about different conceptual entities. So as we um, look in a detailed way at a MARC record, we can see that certain values are about the work, for example, or about the expression. But um, these are, at least in this tool, uh, which is used at our institution, all in the same place. So we found that a really common theme from our catalogers was um, just the very different experience working in the Synopia environment, uh, where at least in its current iteration, and I should mention that this tool is, is in ongoing development, um, it requires catalogers to be very conscious about uh, which conceptual entity they're making statements on. Um, and in fact, it requires them to uh, move back and forth between the different resource templates that I mentioned earlier. And you can see those here as highlighted tabs. Uh, so we found that for catalogers, this having to really be conscious about, um, am I making a statement on the work? Am I making it on the item and so forth was, uh, was a new experience. And, and I would say this is, this is interesting. And I would say this is something that I'm sure, um, goes beyond the use of RDA profiles and probably would apply to uh, using the tool with BibFrame or another model. I know that um, some of this has to do, as we saw in the previous slide with that, that interface where you, you actually have to go to a different tab to make the different statements. So continuing on this theme of sort of some of those first impressions moving from a MARC environment to this linked data tool, um, we, we found that despite the fact that catalogers currently use the RDA content standard to populate MARC records, uh, this really did not translate to an automatic familiarity with RDA and RDF. Um, and so there was a real need for resources uh, that could be used as a cataloger worked their way through the profile and created a description set. And there were a few resources available um, one of those which was linked to um, in our profiles and those links came through into the user interface of Synopia was of course the RDA registry. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the registry is the source for this uh, very complete modeling of RDA um, as linked data. So it's, it's a very complete resource and and has all of the um, ontological information that you really need to implement RDA and RDF. However, we found that as a reference source to be accessed through a browser, the kinds of information that it provided for a cataloger who might simply um, want some assistance in creating a value for an element was pretty limited. Another resource uh, that was available and that could be accessed from the Synopia interface in our profiles was the current version of the RDA toolkit. Um, and this of course has the strength that it provides the very detailed uh, guidance on creating values for elements. And so in that sense, it's, it's really very helpful once you've um, once you've identified which element you're working with in, in just uh, generating and recording that value. However, the, the current toolkit doesn't really 
uh, speak to uh, the RDA entities or elements as linked data building blocks, so to speak. Um, and for this reason, I think that um, were we to go forward with further use of RDA and RDF, I think that the beta toolkit might really represent a great resource for catalogers. And I say this because it sort of combines the best of both worlds. Uh, we see here in a screenshot from the current beta toolkit that you have some very essential information that's needed to work with RDF properties. So we have an identifier, a domain, and a range, um, which sort of really helps ground someone in trying to determine how the data needs to fit together. But of course, we also have the very detailed um, guidance and instructions for recording values. A final piece of feedback uh, that we heard again and again, <laughs> and I included this quote from a cataloger report here, was just to do with the sheer number of properties in our profiles. Um, and this is interesting to me because on the one hand, this is a really uh, just a direct result of the data model that we chose to work with. So in this short little video, um, I scroll through our resource template for an RDA work entity, and you can see that it just goes on and on. Um, and, and you can easily imagine that this working in this template is, is just not very user friendly. Um, so this is, this is really sort of seeing what a data model looks like. Um, when it's implemented in a, in a particular tool for creating descriptions. I also think that it's interesting to think about the ways in which um, the, the development uh, of a tool for, for using profiles could really affect this user experience um, and thinking about the ways in which uh, this really large number of properties might be grouped or categorized or um, compressed when, when not needed and so forth to really change and potentially improve the user experience here. The second way that uh, we are evaluating these profiles is really by looking at uh, the data model itself. And this sort of takes us back to our initial decision um, to, to do a pilot of RDA and RDF for our for our catalog in in Sinopia. So um, among others, we had, we had two reasons that I'll mention here. One being that RDA is the content standard currently used to create library catalog data. Um, and this, this fact, along with our knowledge that um, the RDA model is available in an RDF representation made us want to um, try out RDA profiles. Additionally, um, we, we just feel that as anyone who knows, who has worked with RDA knows um, that this content standard and data model allows us to create really very detailed representations and descriptions of resources. Um, so I think um, in, in looking at the data model in this way, I'm going to spend a little bit of time contrasting it with BibFrame, which as has already been mentioned in today's sessions is really the predominant data model being considered for uh, linked data library cataloging. Uh, apologies in advance for the very text heavy slides. Um, but I'll try to make things somewhat easy to understand. Um, so just looking at some, um, some of what are called RDA element supertypes and subtypes. Uh, this is terminology that I've taken as I uh, participate in some training and try to learn more about the beta toolkit. But um, I've, I've been told that I can think of these as broader elements. Uh, so here we see digital file characteristic as kind of a broad element and below it, uh, we see a number of narrower elements or the, the subtypes that I referred to earlier. In RDF terms, of course, we could call these uh, the digital file characteristic property and its sub properties. So uh, at the left hand side here, we see um, that we have a number of, of properties that sort of give us this uh, way to talk about very granular values for a digital file, um, talking about things 
um, not only the more general digital file characteristic property, but also things like a bit rate and an encoding format and so on. Um, and over to the right hand side, we see that um, this, this value and, and this particular mapping was taken from some work that the PCC did um, and uh, a mapping of the Bibco standard record to Bibframe. But over on the right hand side, we see that we can express this um, same level of detail and granularity in Bibframe. We see that things work a little bit differently. Uh, we're using the same bib frame property digital characteristic to provide all of our values that we had in RDA. And then we go on to type these values with one of a number of bib frame classes. And it's really this class that gives us the, the detail and the granularity that is equivalent to the RDA. Moving on to an example of elements for use with an RDA expression. So here our broader element is contributor agent to performance. Uh, and below it, we have these kind of more granular, uh, granular or narrower elements um, within contributor agent. So DJ, animator, art director, and so forth. Um, and again, we see Looking at the RDA, we get an idea of the sort of data structure where it's, it's just a property value pair as we go through and provide these values. Um, moving to the right hand side, we, we see the way that uh, equivalent data is structured in BibFrame looks a little bit different. We have a couple of different properties starting from the left uh, that allow us to make a statement that there is a contribution. Uh, that that contribution has an agent, and we're then able to provide our value uh, for the various agents that we had in the RDA. Um, we also see moving farther to the right that by uh, using an additional bib frame property of role and some identifiers from the mark relator term list that we are able to um, encode this detail in certain circumstances. So we see that for contributor, animator, art director, and a couple other examples, uh, we're able to really fully extend the bib frame to encode the same level of detail as RDA. But here in this example, we begin to see where things kind of break down. Um, and, and those cases in which um, in this example, there's no equivalent mark relator term available. And we see that it, it begins to become a little bit difficult to, um, to encode the same level of detail in bib frame as we can with the RDA and RDF. Finally, my last example um, here with some elements for use with an RDA work entity. Um, again, the broader element description of work over on the left-hand side, and then some of the narrower elements looking at um, different kinds of descriptions such as analysis, commentary, critique, and so forth. And moving this data into BibFrame, we see that um, we have a couple of properties available for use. Um, these are properties that we've identified in some mapping work at the University of Washington. These are not uh, properties that we've found in existing mapping work from the PCC uh, or elsewhere. Someone might correct me if, if they know of a mapping, but we see that although we have uh, the references property and the subject property to work with that um, we have not identified any additional properties or classes that, that will allow us to encode the granularity here. So in this particular example, we see that really um, what our five or six relationships in RDA get sort of compressed in bib frame. Um, and, and in this particular example would all be, would all be expressed in the same way and sort of some, some loss of detail at that point. So if you're, if you're watching this and you're thinking, okay, well, this, this is really detailed and really granular, but uh, what's the point? Um, I, I will say that I think this is a fair question. Um, I think that this is the kind of question that we need to be asking. Um, we need to be asking and thinking about things like uh, how this detail could be used by a discovery system um, and, and all, all the questions that we, would, that we would ask about any content standard that we would need in terms of how it would meet user needs and how well it would allow us to manage our collections and descriptions.
Um, so really, excuse me, um, bringing things back to my statement at the beginning that this is a work in progress, um, I think that the, um, the effort to evaluate profiles and data models will require us to be very collaborative uh, and move beyond um, a look solely at metadata and data models and, and really require us to collaborate with search and discovery experts, user experience experts and others. Um, and I'd like to just take a moment to um, say that I think the LD4P project has been really fantastic in creating opportunities for this kind of collaboration with some of the interest groups that have grown out of the project, looking at things like discovery systems, looking at um, profile development itself. And I really think that it's to be hoped that uh, this collaboration will continue on and will really inform us as we make the decisions that will will shape the way library descriptions work as we move into a linked data environment. So that uh, concludes my presentation. And I think I, think I should have a little bit of time left um, to, to handle any questions at this point. So I can go over to the question document um, and start taking a look at that. Um, all right, I'm, I'm not sure if the moderators will be reading questions or not, but I'm just gonna go ahead and hop over here. Um, so thank you yeah. for these questions. Oh, yeah, sorry, Paloma. Okay. Just okay. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, uh, I, I took a look. So how many catalogers were involved? Uh, I think we had a little over a dozen catalogers, um, including a lot of really great help from uh, our principal cataloger at UW, Adam Schiff. Um, and we've, we've received 10 really, really great um, detailed reports from catalogers. And we also, uh, we also set up a feedback form for folks and have, have received a lot of feedback through that form that's allowed us to um, keep tinkering with our profiles and improving our profiles and provide, um, provide feedback to the Sinopia developers and do lots of other things. So next question, having a reference source for RDA to RDF and Sinopia would be helpful training to share wink, wink, thank you. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'd be, I'd be happy to share, I'd be happy to share our resources. Um, I would love to speak with um, the person posting this and, and find out what kind of resources they're, they're interested in and, and would be happy to pass along um, anything that we've got. Um, so that, that would be great. Um, I think everyone should have my email, but I'm just gonna pop it in here just in case. Um, so um, if possible, please reach out and, and let's talk about this. Uh, the profile for EGA work consists of all properties of the RDA registry with domain work. You didn't pick and choose the ones a cataloger has to put in to establish a work record. So this is a great question. Um, this profile development started by us, um, and I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually giving the next presentation, and I'll be talking about this, but profile development started with us pulling in everything from the RDA registry. So for example, we had every, uh, every property available for use with a work entity. And then at that point, um, a, science cataloger who was on the team, and I, I really should have um, been explicit earlier. I, I'm sure it's obvious, but this development was, was certainly a team effort um, with Theo Gerontakos, another librarian at my institution, and Crystal Clements, a science cataloger at my institution. And at the beginning of the development process, she had a long back and forth with other catalogers about which elements were needed for each of these entities. And in fact, um, not only which elements were needed for the entities, but actually 
uh, which elements were needed for a work uh, for use with monographs or for use with DVD videos, uh, for example. Uh, and so as I'll talk about a little bit in my next presentation, uh, the way that this worked was we, we went through that single source profile and started to mark those elements or properties. Um, and we marked them in a way that they would be output to the various format specific profiles. So to answer your question in a roundabout way, no, we, we did not use everything and we did pick and choose. Um, and this was, a, this was an ongoing process and we have continued to receive feedback. Um, you know, we're, we're wrapping up our Synopia work for the time being at the University of Washington right now. Uh, but we received this feedback all through all through the process. Um, I think I have one minute left. So this sub question here, do, do you use the profiles for establishing the edit templates or for validation? Um, yes, they they do establish the edit templates. So the profiles are are what creates that Synopia interface that you saw earlier, the the one with that just went on and on. Um, that is that is indeed what what creates um, what I think is being referred to here as edit templates. But in Synopia terms, we would say a resource template. At this point, the profiles themselves are not directly um, a part of validation, um, and we're validation is kind of an open question for us. So that's a that's a really interesting thing to think about. Um, I see that it's 1015, so I should probably wrap up, but I'll say that I'm happy to respond to the rest of these questions in the document. And uh, thanks again, everyone, for being here. Thanks so much, Ben. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, so we are about to have a break now, 15 minutes. And after that, we are going to...